Hello, I'm so sorry I cannot join you in Duraki Pundit University today, but I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to share some results with you through this video link. We all know that skills are the fundamental driver of individual success and that they have become the currency of 21st century economies. Data from our survey of adult skills show that people at the high end of the skill distribution of the test that we gave to people in the workforce are more than twice as likely to be employed than those at the low end of the skill distribution. They are almost three times as likely to earn a good wage. And it doesn't stop with money. We see a strong relationship between the perceived health of people and their skills, their propensity to volunteer. People at the high end of the skill distribution see themselves as actors in our societies. People at the low end see themselves as objects of political processes. Even trust in our societies is closely related to the skills that people have, what people know and what they can do with what they know. At the very same time, it's also clear that you know degrees and qualifications do not automatically translate into better skills and better lives of people. You can see that in some countries, you know, university graduates have great difficulties finding a job. And at the very same time, employers cannot find the people with the skills they need. Look at the share of employers facing recruitment difficulties, even in countries like Japan, also India, Brazil. It's a lot we need to do. Formal degrees and qualifications are not the answer. We need to understand better what, what knowledge and skills drive economic and social outcomes. And one thing is clear, the modern world no longer rewards people just for what they know. No. Google knows everything. But it rewards people for what they can do with what they know. That's become the differentiator. It's about learning the right mix of skills. But how do we learn it? What are the most effective and efficient ways to acquire skills throughout life, in a lifelong and life-wide process? How can we integrate the world of education with the world of work? How can economies and labor markets actually utilize their skill potential? It's a big, big question in our economies. How can we extract value from the skills that people have? And last but not least, you know, how do we decide, you know, how do we share the costs and benefits of skill development? Who should pay for what, when and how? Very, very important questions that we will be able, uh, that we need to answer in this case. Let me sort of show you the framework in which we think about those questions. Of course, it has to do with the development of relevant skills and making sure that, you know, our societies have access to the right skills, but also making sure that we can activate the skills that are available, that they get recognized, used. And last but not least, putting skills to the most effective use. It's about matching supply and demand of skills. Let me talk you through these things in a bit more detail based on the results of our evidence. The biggest question today is, you know, how do we understand the changing demand for skills? In 2014, the economists had this cover suggesting that, you know, about 50% of the work in the U.S. labor market could probably be digitized with today's technology. And the dilemma for educators is that the kind of things that are easy to teach, maybe it is a test are precisely the kind of things that are also easy to, easy to digitize, automate, and outsource. This is not just about, you know, robots taking over whole factories. That's one factor, but not everything. You know. Today you can have a car without a driver getting through the dense traffic of Bangkok without an accident, without human intervention. What's that going to do to tomorrow's jobs? in our economies, our societies. It's no longer about, you know, some factory being automated somewhere. It's about what's happening in your neighborhood, in your street, right in front of you. Think about augmented reality. We're now able to bring the world's complete knowledge into everything we do in real time, integrating what we know, what the world knows. Huge impact. 
And again, one of the implications is that the world will no longer reward us just for what we know, but for what we can do with what we know, activating knowledge. And there's a lot more to come that is going to fundamentally change our societies, our economies. We already see, you know, many people these days complain about, you know, declining productivity in our countries. But in fact, you know, that's not so simple. In fact, in the frontier firms, you know, the firms that are ahead of the curve, that are really, really good, they are actually seeing significantly rising productivity. But where we are not successful in diffusing innovation, diffusing new knowledge, work with very traditional means, there we are seeing declining productivity. So we see how those lines diverge. You know, some firms racing ahead, becoming richer and richer, others rising productivity, and others actually falling behind. And we see that both in the manufacturing and service sector. How well are we equipped? You know, one of the things that we did in our survey of adult skills is we tested the skills of people directly. One area where we focused on was problem solving skills. Problem solving in a digital environment. And when we got the results, we found that, you know, in some countries, there is a greater share of adults who are more better equipped in, for the digital world. You know, you look at Sweden, Finland, and the Netherlands, and then other countries like Ireland and Poland, where workers struggle. You know? Here you see the results for the population 16 to 65 year olds. But you know, even in the most optimistic case, look at Sweden and Finland, we're still only talking about 40% of the workforce who are reasonably ready for the digital age. And I'm not talking about, you know, computer programmers, people using advanced kind of skills here. This is basically about everyday use of technology. And now I'm going to know what you're going to tell me. Now, this is all about older workers not keeping up with change. But actually, if you look at the young population, 16 to 24 year olds, yes, it does look better. But not as much as you might expect. No? There are some differences. You look at Korea, for example. No? In Korea, you see a huge advantage of young people over older generations. No? This is a country that has progressed very rapidly in equipping people with better skills. But look at the line just above Korea. That's the United States. And there you can see that people entering the workforce are not much better skills than those leaving for retirement. The skills gap is actually very narrow. Education and training have not very significantly progressed when it comes to those kinds of problem-solving skills. So overall, there's a lot more, even the advanced nations, you know, I'm talking here about nations that have actually quite high in income. There's a lot of homework we have to do to equip more people with better skills to collaborate, compete, and connect. And you can actually see when you look, this is data from the United States, actually, that again, you know, there's a decline in the demand for manual skills. This is about the factories that get automated, very clear. But actually, the steepest decline in demand is no longer about manual skills. It's about what we call routine cognitive skills. Memorizing something and expecting, you know, that's going to make you successful later in life. What schools used to be very good at, that's actually at sort of challenged most significantly. You see a rise in the demand in non-routine analytic skills. It's about creative skills, problem-solving skills non-routine interpersonal skills, social skills. Very significant changes in the nature of the skills that make people successful. Success today is very much about ways of thinking, creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, decision making. It's about ways of working, communication, collaboration. And it is about the tools for working. The hardest part, but I don't think we should, you know, neglect it, is about character qualities. Think about resilience, adaptability, curiosity, initiative, leadership, courage, integrity, mindfulness, self-awareness, empathy. Those kinds of qualities that are hard to capture, hard to measure, but are, that are of increasing importance to success at work and at life these days. 
understanding changing demand for skills is important but then you know how do we respond to this how we improve quality and equity in education and training i bring you back to the survey of adult skills and you can see actually you know even some of the most advanced nations there's a sizable share of 16 to 29 year olds showing very low numeracy skills look at the united states some extremely talented people in the United States, but there's also about 30% of young people who don't even have the most basic or just have the most basic skills in numeracy. And why is that important? Well, look at this chart. Now you can see actually that the share of workers in routine jobs is dramatically rising if those skill levels get very low. So you see the people who lack foundation skills, basic numeracy skills, are most at risk to end up in the routine jobs that are disappearing fastest in our economy. Those are the people who are very, very vulnerable to economic change. And you know, one thing is clear. People will never accept that their job is disappearing if they don't have the confidence and the skills that they can find a new one or create a new job. So those data are really, really important. We also need to you know, move away from qualifications focused education upfront in people's life course to lifelong skills oriented learning. Let me again show you some data. Here you see in the case of Italy, the distribution of the middle half of people in skills by different qualification levels. The lowest bar shows you the middle half of the population with skills who have not completed school. And you can see they are not all low skilled actually. There's a lot of variability in skills because some people who may not have completed school have actually acquired a lot of skills at the workplace or elsewhere. And there's a lot of overlap in the skills of those people with those who have completed school. And interestingly, you know, people with a university degree, that's the highest bar, generally they're better skilled than people with schools. But again, there's a lot of overlap. There are a lot of high school graduates who are actually better skilled in, than Italian university graduates. And when you look at this across countries, you know, even a country like Japan that has a great education system shows that kind of overlap. Degrees and qualifications are actually not very accurate predictors of the skills people actually have. There's a lot of variability across countries as well. You can see, for example, that a Japanese high school graduate is typically better skilled than an Italian university graduate. Huge variability. And the message here really is that, you know, we always, you know, when we look at somebody's CV, we look at the formal degrees and qualifications that they attained at one point in their lives, but they're not actually a very accurate predictor of what these people can do today because we acquire new skills as we progress in our careers and equally important we lose the kind of skills that we do not use. How do we develop those skills? One of the lessons that we have learned is that it's so important to empl involve employers in designing curricula and delivering educational programs. Have a look at some of our data here. These data show you the skill levels on the vertical axis for the age group 16 or 25 on the horizontal axis. And I've now divided those people into four groups. The red line are the young people who are in education. They start at a high point and they end up better than where they started. So if you are in school or in university, you appear to learn something. But the interesting part is if you combine education and work, that's the green line. You started with lower because typically vocational education and training is not as prestigious as academic learning, but you end up pretty much at the same point. Even people who are just in work see a quite steep progression in, this, progression in their skill levels. The only people in trouble are those who are not in education and not in work, and there you can actually see they end up worse than where they started. That's very important, you know. Skills that we do not use, we actually lose. If young people don't get a chance to get employed, actually we risk that they sort of lose what they had once obtained. Combining education and work. You know, and often we talk about this. These days, you know, people always talk about, you know, apprenticeship 
has a very, very good way of skill development. And it's true. But not everything that is labeled as an apprenticeship is an apprenticeship in the sense of providing truly work-based learning. And our research shows that it's the work-based learning component that actually makes up much of the quality of apprenticeship. Look at this data here. You go to Germany, for example, you can see basically apprenticeship is really about, you know, a very significant share of work-based learning. But, you know, you go to England and Northern Ireland, and there you can see, you know, is actually a very, very small share of people in apprenticeships who actually do participate in work-based learning. So, you know, let's be careful about the labels. Let's look at what actually happens. To what extent work-based learning occurs? Judge programs based on that. And you can see huge differences here. So how do we engage employers? The first thing is, you know, to ensure that employers, unions, and other stakeholders are there to strengthen the links between educational programs and labor market needs. And it's very easy to do, you know, for large employers, they can provide great training, great programs, and so on. When it comes to small and medium enterprises, and I'm saying this because in your country, in your area, that's a very large share of those enterprises. It is very difficult to engage them because they tell you, you know, I'm too small. I can't actually put up a whole training program and so on. But there are answers to this. You go to Norway, for example, where firms collectively promote apprenticeships. Now they basically build kind of collaboratives uh, that actually operate at regional levels with a specific focus on trades. So there's a good examples of this. Switzerland is another interesting example where you know firms may share apprentices. You know, I may not be able to provide for a full apprentice, but apprentices can actually work at multiple firms at the very same time. And so a lot of benefits for both firms and apprentices. So there are answers to the issue of small and medium sized enterprises that we can actually take into account. I want to reiterate one other element, and that is about integrating work-based learning systematically in whatever we call vocational education. And that's, we call it the mandatory principle, not sort of adding this on, but building, making this a critical pass. No? And it is best if it is systematic, if it's credit-bearing, and if it's quality assured. And you can actually incentivize this through funding arrangements. There are a lot of ways how you can do that. It's also important to carefully listen to employers when it comes to the content of curricula and the qualifications. To guide the adaptation to emerging requirements, to develop qualifications and workplace training arrangements, and so on. Sometimes, you know, vocational education is very narrowly focused on current skill requirements, on specific occupational classes. It helps people get into a job, but it's not so good when people change their jobs. So it's important to build transversal skills in the vocational programs, ensuring that, you know, people also develop the foundations that it's going to help them, you know, change their job, grow in that job. You can see that here, basic graduates of vocational programs have often much weaker foundation skills uh, than graduates of academic programs. So there's a lot of vocational education and training can actually improve here. You need to ensure that the institutions and mechanisms to engage employers represent the diverse perspectives and opinions within employer groups. And that's not trivial because, you know, employers are not employers, firms are not firms. They may have very different interests and views of what is important, how to train people. So recognizing those differences in views and perspectives is very, very important in the design of instructional system. And last but not least, you know, you need to find the appropriate role for government that helps students and balances the perspectives of employers, unions, and the interests of students. So it's a sort of some mechanisms that we have found working really well. You need to share the costs fairly among governments, individuals, and employers. The question of who pays, who benefits. Employers can, can create a climate that supports learning, invest in learning. People also must take more responsibility for their skill development throughout their working life, not just in initial education. As governments, we can design financial in incentives. We can uh, design favorable tax policies that encourage individuals and employers to invest 
training and move up the value chain. You look to Singapore, you know, if you hire low skilled people as an employer, you end up paying more taxes. So there's a lot of incentive for you to actually move up the value chain. So developing relevant skills in our economies has to do a lot with engaging employers to develop, to help provide the right mix of skills. It has to do with career guidance. Very, very important. Who tells young people the truth? That has to do with providing effective guidance. Now recognize that rapidly evolving jobs and careers have expanded career opportunities. There's a lot more choice available. Choices are becoming harder, more difficult. That's why career guidance is so important. Not telling people what, how the world looks and where their strengths and weaknesses are. Providing reliable, impartial sources of guidance so that young people do not have to you know, listen just to their neighbors and other informal services. Establish a coherent, and in our view it's important, an independent guidance profession. Often, you know, educators are not so good in providing career guidance. They didn't have first an experience in the labor market. Develop sort of qualification system for career advisors. Preserve the independence is a very, very important in our view. And then support guidance with resources, information, good evaluation. All of those elements are really important. Give people good information of where to invest in their skills. Preparing teachers with good industry experience. Encouraging trainers in educational institutions to spend some of their time working in industry. Promoting flexible pathways of recruiting. Providing appropriate pedagogical and other preparation for trainers. Those things really, really matter. Maximizing the use of workplace training. You hear me saying this for the third time. Because I really think in your region that is not sufficiently established. It's one of the cracks. You know, there's a lot of focus on vocational education, but we don't see the place of work as the kind of place where much of that learning really can happen. Using effective tools to engage stakeholders, transparency, qualification frameworks, all of those instruments are important and it's those kinds of things that ensure high quality education for all. That's about, you know, developing relevant skills. But it's not enough. You know, you can have a lot of talent in your country and they may be leaving your country because your country isn't good in using those kinds of skills. And that's why I also want to touch on the importance of activating skill supply. Figuring out, you know, who is not working? What are the incentives that make it pay to work? Dismantling some of the non-financial barriers for people to participate in the workforce important. And last but not least, how do we put skills to their most effective use? Let me show you sort of a couple of pointers here. Again, you know, highlighting the importance to match skills with their needs. Productivity today has a lot to do not just with the skills people have but how intensively they are used. Again, from our survey of adult skills, on the vertical axis you see labor productivity and on the horizontal axis you see an indicator of the use of reading skills. This is not about the skills people have, but how intensively they use them at the workplace. And you can see how powerful a predictor the use of reading skills at work is for productivity. You can actually see this also nicely on this chart, which shows the link between skills mismatch and earnings. I've divided workers into four groups. The green line is what I call a high skill match. This is basically employers working at the high end of the value chains, hiring very skilled people and paying them well. That's the scenario where you make most of the money. And you can see actually, you know, this is where people earn a lot when they start their job and they keep growing. They get more and more better salaries because they become more productive. The yellow line is where people have a skills deficit. It means that the job demands high skills, but they are not quite up to it. What you see here is that they start out lower than the people in the green line, and that's quite intuitive because, you know, your employer is not going to pay you for skills which you don't have. But what's so interesting is as people progress, they keep getting more money. 
sort of scales demand. If the demand is higher than what you have, you just keep growing in your career. It looks very different when you have a scaled surplus, so when you have scales that don't come to bear in your workplace. You start, okay, but you decline in your prospects. And in a low skill ma ma match situation, you know, your employer doesn't ask for great skills, you need to have them, you can see also how things slope downwards. In other words, you know, skill match really matters. And it matters more as you become older. It's a very, very important finding. The reason I'm highlighting this also is because, you know, don't expect that economies will automatically move from a low skill match situation to a high skill match situation. Unfortunately, you know, low skill match is a very stable reality. You can have an employer, you know, somewhere in Thailand who actually is quite happy to make money with, you know, producing cheap but cheap outputs with low skilled and cheap labor. And there's no intrinsic incentive for that situation to change. It's a lot to do with government policy. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. What can we do? The first thing is to provide better information about the skills that are needed and the skills that are available. Think about it this way. You know, when you on the left side of the chart, you can see the percentage of workers who are over and under qualified. And on the right side, you see the percentage of people who are overskilled and underskilled. Now, on the left side, you can see that in many countries, there are a lot of people running around who have better qualifications than what they actually need at the workplace. But it would be, would be a mistake to conclude that they are overeducated because they're not overskilled. Take the example of Sweden. 20% you know, of work, Sweden's workers are overqualified. But you know, just about five, six percent actually have better skills than they, what they need at the work, current workplace. So our labor markets are typically quite good in using the skills of people, but the signaling systems that we use, formal degrees and qualifications, are not very good in signaling. That's the issue that you can see really very clearly in this data. Helping young people gain a foothold in the labor market is very important. Making skills more transparent. If you have great skills but nobody knows about it, what a pity for you and for your country. I'm a good example. You know, I'm a physics graduate. I got my degree in physics, a good degree. But if you put me in a laboratory today, I'm probably not going to be very productive. Because, you know, the world of physics, of science has evolved so much since I got my degrees many years ago. And I probably have forgotten a lot of the knowledge that I once obtained. At the very, but that's still, you know, what you see in my CV. At the very same time, I've learned a lot in the field of education and skills, which is not mirrored in the formal degrees and qualifications that I have, you know. And if we can't, you know, make the skills that we have more transparent, we struggle. Or think about, you know, your country, Thailand. How many people work in the informal economy who have actually quite a lot of skills in some areas, but, you know, nobody knows how to recognize, certify those skills. So these people will never have a chance to get a decent job. Very, very important part to make skills more transparent, to help employers make better use of their employees' skills. I want to show you a chart on this, again from our survey of adult skills. Remember I told you, you know, that Japanese workers have very high skills and American workers have only so-so skills. But when it comes to the use of skills, the picture looks very different. Yeah? Look at the green bars. For the United States, they're very long. There's no economy in the world, at least in the countries for which you have data, that extracts value from skills as good as the United States economy. You know? Converting better skills into better jobs and a better life. That's what the United States economy does so well. Even if it doesn't have so great skills, it extracts great value from them. If you look at the Japanese economy, very rigid, very siloed, siloed very much focused on formal credentials. And you can see it's not very good in making good use out of skills. No? Maybe in reading and writing, but numeracy is so-so. Technology, not good. And problem solving, very poor. So this shows us, you know, you can develop great talent, but activating the talent 
bringing it to efficient use, extracting value from talent, is equally important if you want to advance your economy. Employers can do a lot in making that happen. Creating more high-value added jobs, creating incentives for economies to move up the value chain, very, very important. Fostering entrepreneurship, really important. And again, schooling and education is where entrepreneurship is born. Every baby, every small child is an entrepreneur, willing to explore the world, willing to take risks, willing to be curious. But as we become older, actually, we lose some of that sense. So putting skills to effective use is the third pillar that is really, really important for success. So let me summarize this. Success has to do with high quality initial education and lifelong learning. Investing in high quality early childhood education, initial schooling, providing financial support for disadvantage, providing opportunities and incentives to continue development of proficiency at work, outside work. Making learning everybody's business. Governments, employers, workers, parents, all need to have effective and equitable arrangements of who should pay for what, when, and how. It's about effective links between learning and work, an emphasis on workplace learning, developing people, allowing people to develop hard skills or modern equipment and soft skills, a real world experience. Allowing workers to adapt learning to their lives, not the other way around giving people the flexibility to decide what they learn, how they learn, where they learn, when they learn. Our education training institutions are often far too rigid to actually ensure this is happening. Improving transparency and easy to find information about adult education activities. Ensuring good guidance. I highlight the importance of you know, career guidance, timely data about demand and supply for skills competent person who have the latest labor market information at their fingertips to help learners find their way through an increasingly complex world of work. Helping employers make better use of skills, the flexible work arrangements that accommodate workers with care obligations, disabilities, special interests, encouraging workers to stay in work throughout their lives, helping economies move up the value chain. And again, this is not something, you know, just listening and let the markets play. Governments can do a lot to incentivize an intelligent, effective use of skills. So those are the kind of issues that really make for a strategic approach. Of course, you know, it comes down to difficult choices. It's about prioritizing investments. Some people say, you know, you should invest in early learning. Some people say, well, you need to invest in the people out in the workplace to provide them with continuing education and training. Getting those priorities right is central. Combining short-term and long-term considerations now. What are the skills that are needed? Employers are very good in telling you the skills they need today. They're not so good in telling you the skills that is going to make Thailand a more competitive economy tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So basically getting the balance right is very important. A life cycle perspective. Lifelong learning, life-wide learning are the keys to success. And you can see actually we're not doing really well on this. You know, this shows you the skills of people over their life cycle. You can see how if people develop skills up to the age of 30, and then you can see a deterioration of our skills. Very important to do better on lifelong, life-wide learning. And if you think about the lives of people, you can imagine how many government players are involved in this. Creating a whole of government approach, getting ministries of education, ministries of labor, economy, financial affairs together to think about, you know, how do we foster learning best? How do we use the skills of be people best? How do we translate education into better skills, and better lives, and better, pe better things? And finally, aligning perspectives of different levels of government, multiple stakeholders. This is not just you know, a public business. This is a whole of society project to make that really work. But again, we have some very successful examples of countries that have 
demonstrated this. In fact, in your region of the world, in Asia, there's so many star performers that have been able to make that transition, to make that happen. This is what the strate strategic approach, a skill strategy is about. This is what the work of the OECD, our work in Paris, is about. And again, the focus of your conference. I thank you very much.